This is Corey Willis with PPI, and you're listening to the Diesel Podcast. I'm Adam Blattenberg from Diesel World. This is Dan, owner of Dan's Diesel Performance. I'm Braden Fleece, and you're listening to the Diesel Podcast. What is going on, Diesel Nation? We're excited to have you guys with us today on the Diesel Podcast. Today's guest we had on in January, it's Lenny Reed from Dynamite Diesel Products, and we had a blast with him last time. It was really fun talking to him, not just about diesel parts in the diesel industry, but his personal story, things that he's overcome, and really kind of an insight into him and how that translates into his company and the products that he makes. There was a tremendous response that we had from it, and we heard from people all over the world. And they're like, hey, get Lenny back on. We want to hear what he thinks about this or what he's doing with these parts or what does he think the, the future of diesel is going to be in regards to you know this particular aspect of it. So it's going to be a really fun conversation. We're going to ask him about something we've been seeing a lot of chatter about recently, and that's electric power, electric vehicles, specifically trucks. And I wanted to ask him, you know, what do you think about it? Do you think it's going to overtake diesel in the future? Do you think we're all going to be driving electric trucks you know down the road and that's going to be what's going to be used to tow our boats and work and a daily drive so we're going to get his answer on that and then we also wanted to talk to him about competition he's a very competitive guy and we wanted to ask him how that translates into business being a business owner and also with his products and and the things that he's innovating in the future that he envisions there was a lot of Listeners last time that are like, hey, I'm a plumber, I'm an electrician, I work in real estate, I love diesel, but I loved hearing what Lenny was talking about with his personal growth as a business owner and being able to maintain success and really lead his industry. So we want to touch on that as well. All right, let's get to the podcast with Lenny talking to him about the diesel community, diesel performance's future, and also our electric trucks going to be the future of what we're driving. Lenny, welcome back to the Diesel Podcast. I had a really great time on our last episode, and there was a lot of feedback that we got from diesel truck owners, and then also people who are interested in, gosh, business, fitness, just really interesting conversation. So it was uh, a really awesome episode. I encourage any listeners that haven't heard it, definitely make sure you back a few and uh, listen to the conversation I had with Lenny and Ryan Houston. But today we're going to kind of expand on some of the things we touched on before. So we're, we're glad to have you back on the podcast. Uh, you know, uh, it's really an honor to be back already. And I had I had a ton of people that reached out to me as well from like New Zealand and just all around, like a bunch of people in the States and in Canada. But it definitely made me think like, wow, this podcast is actually, you've done an extremely good job. If I've got somebody from New Zealand saying, hey, man, I'm just starting a diesel shop. And he tells me about these motors he's working on. I'm like, I have no idea what that is. But hey, it's really cool <laughs> that you found the podcast. Yeah, it is. It, it's fun. And just, it, I remember seeing some messages come in on our end and, and chatting with you a little bit and people loved hearing from you. And I wanted to to start with, you know, last time we talked, you had mentioned some new machines and some new equipment that you guys were getting. And that should be pretty close now, right? Or, or you guys might already have them. Uh, actually, so since the last time we talked, which is just after the first of the year, uh, the machine has been fired up. It has been making parts. And the parts that are being made are being tested right now. Like, we've been testing those parts, but we haven't made them. They've been the, – the company I'm buying the EDM from is actually making the parts for us. We leave this coming Sunday, myself and Skylar from the shop, and we'll be gone for just a little bit over a week. And so we'll get, like, you know, a full 40, 50 hours on the machine. We're taking a bunch of nozzles with us, and we will come home hopefully – intelligent enough to be able to write our own programs without having to call dad and ask for help and uh so yeah we're we're basically you know we'll be there for a week and then there's going to be a week in transit they send an installation expert out to uh, install machines so hopefully hopefully a month from right now we're we're on our own feet and we're uh we might not be sprinting but at least we're walking with it and it's going to be really some really cool products and things like you mentioned last time that you're going to be able to do with this capability for diesel injectors and nozzles and the precision of them, which, you know, fits into the, the larger topic that we definitely hit on last time. And today we're going to spend, you know, the most of our time on is the, the diesel industry and, and competition. And we, we were chatting, you know, before the podcast a little bit, and I know the premier land cruise was recently. So it's like, 
all these companies, all these people are around each other, and you guys have all built successful businesses, whether it's injectors or injection pumps or turbos, transmissions, whatever it might be. It's just a huge like convention of people who have been successful in their respective businesses. And I wanted to ask you about your competitive nature and how it relates to like your personal growth with dynamite diesel products, but then also, you know, in the industry itself and with some of the challenges that are always in business and always in industries and trends that are going on right now in the automotive market. Um, well, I, I, I do believe that if you're going to be self-employed, you'd better be really competitive because if you're not, it, it's the complete opposite of the nature of any single game. Um, Yes, I make injectors. That's what I specialize in, and I'm going to be very competitive mentally against anybody else that builds injectors. But whether I, you know, manufacture bread, deliver bread, uh, you know, sell and install tires, which I've done when I was a younger guy, uh, any one of those things, if you're going to be top-notch, you'd better plan on putting in a lot of effort, getting really good. Once you get really good at it, try and think about the efficient way to do it because you're going to work yourself to death and – that's not a great way to go either. So, you know, I think that there's a, whether it's BMX racing, uh, football, you know, like the gym's always been a big thing. At one point, I water skied for a while. I loved water skiing. And it started out as like, hey, you know, like, I'm going to stand here, drink a few beers, get on a water ski, and enjoy my day. And then pretty soon, this was way back, like, you know, 2000, you know, probably like 92, 93, 94. We were out at 6 a.m., and we had these great big, like, brick video cameras. We'd go home and watch ourselves. And, you know, like, when you're on the water and you're, you're, you're making a cut, you think, wow, that's going to look gorgeous. And then you look at yourself on TV, and you're like, ooh, I, I could definitely do some better. Like, <laughs> so, you know, like, if you're going to be competitive, you've got to be suspect. You've got to be very acceptant to your own um, criticalness, and you've got to change and, and manipulate yourself. and uh, you know, I guess that's kind of what you're trying to tie in is like this, this market sort of changing and the competitive people that I know that are in this industry, uh, I don't see anybody giving up. Um, I did speak to a bunch of the guys last year on the, or last week on the premier cruise and how's things, you know, how's things going? And even things that were carb approved guys are claiming they're down like 20, 30% in sales year to date. But they've also branched out into F-150, and they've branched out into the Jeep and all this other stuff, so they're still super busy. But diesel, the diesel marketplace has softened up for them, and that's exactly what I see kind of happening. It's just like the attitude over everybody right now is very sober, just not very fun. It's very, it's kind of sad to see it, but I don't think that people are seeing it yet. I don't think that they're seeing the real big picture, and that's, you know, in... 1980, the Chevy Camaro, the Ford Mustang, all those cars were garbage. You know, they just barely got smog pumps. They just barely got catalytic converters. They were slow. You know, if they made 200 horsepower, you were lucky. Um, the systems changed, injection changed, and now, like, you can go buy a, a Chevy Camaro with 650 horsepower. So, and it handles, it stops, it drives, it's got all the creature comforts. Cars are way better. It's just going to take the diesel people the ones that want to stand it, the ones that really love it, and the consumers, the people that actually truly love diesel. Um, you know, if you jump ship right now, I, I think it's a bad mistake. Like, if you've got a diesel truck, you own it because you want to tow something. And if you jump ship to to anything, I still think that diesel is king, and I still think that uh, that these next couple of years, the tide will turn, and people will start to see that throwing an airbox on it only gained them five or seven horsepower but it also picked them up like two or three tenths of a mile per gallon. Well, it might not have been deleting it and tuning it and then all of a sudden picking up uh, 50 or 60 or 100 horsepower and three miles per gallon, but we're still there. Now it's just a matter of making sure that we're, uh, we're, we're starting to count on all the little stuff. Like our injectors today, they work. Pick up 30, 40, 50 horsepower, it's still within factory map. So it's not going to do anything harmful to the DPF or anything like that that a stock injector wouldn't have done. Throttle response is way better. Drivability is way better. The fun factor is way better. You drive a 2020 truck, like it's got six gears. 
every time it shifts, it's always in or close to peak power, and it, it just drives and rides really nice. Everything works great. Uh, people complain about mileage today. Well, it's self-induced. My first truck was a 94 Dodge, had a five-speed manual, had cloth seats and carpet, and it was a standard cab. I threw some 30, and it, you know, in that form, it would get close to 20 miles per gallon. It was great. You know, I just got in this truck and drove it. I threw some 35s on it, which was a big tire 20 years ago, and boom, I'm down to like 14, 16 miles per gallon, but it had 35s, and I was still cool. Today, you know, you go buy a brand-new truck, and they get 14, 15, 16 miles per gallon. Well, then you throw, because nobody buys 35s. Like, that's damn near stock, right? Yeah. Everybody's sitting 37s or 40s or 38s and, and huge, heavy wheels. Well, you're not only carrying mass down the highway, but you're also rotating that heavy mass as well. So the deficit is, like, even more of a negative. And then, bam, you're complaining because you get 12, 13 miles per gallon. Oh, wow. I'm, I'm sorry. You just you completely overlook the obvious. And you've got a 9,000-pound truck that's got every creature comfort. I mean, if I had to pick, like, two spots to just live, my home or my truck, my truck's nicer. Like, none of my couches at home have heated seats. <laughs> my truck does. You know, these trucks are amazing today. But they're also brutally heavy. And as soon as we start adding big lift kits and even leveling kit, I don't care what you do. Throw a leveling kit on it, even stock tires, you lose mile, mile and a half a gallon. And the same guy's going to complain because he only picked up three-tenths of a mile per gallon when he bought a set of injectors or a box. Like, come on, bud. Well, a lot has changed. Like, if we think back, it's, the older trucks can almost be nostalgic or be put on a pedestal in a way. But, you know, would anyone today buy a, a Dodge, you know, a Ram truck with a second-gen interior? Would they want to deal with the VP44 failures? Would... You know, the, the injector problems with the LB7s, would we as consumers today withstand that? Would we be okay with it? Probably not. And I think a lot of times the, the, the power and the performance side, that's what we see. That's the cool factor, right? That's the, the events and the pictures and YouTube videos and all that. But the vast majority of diesel truck owners don't do that. They, they really buy these because they want them to last and they're towing something and they want the room and the capability, the versatility of it. And I would feel comfortable saying that the trucks today are, the whole package are the best diesel trucks that have ever been made. Now, granted, the older ones are simpler and you can make more power for less money per se, you know, on a 12 valve or something like that. But we become accustomed to those heated seats, the cooled seats, um, the, uh, the the technology that's in them, and that's the really exciting part about how far it's come. And I definitely agree with you, like that, that sober kind of feeling that uh, some people may have. It, it, one of the most common responses we got to your last podcast was the the story you told about some of the challenges you had in business and overcame them. And I think that's what it, it inspired people. What, what touched them was, hey, you know, this, this challenging situation came up, emerged from it, you know, is stronger than ever, is doing better than ever, expanding into these, um, you know, different technologies and things you can do with your injectors. And I think that's what right now offers is, yeah, those early 80s, late 70s cars, we wouldn't buy those now with 170 horsepower. We want, we want, you know, 700, 730, 680, whatever it is. And that's, that's the way it's going. You know, I, I really want to use a couple of your examples to prove my point. Your examples were VP44 failures. Okay. Uh, truck came out in 98 and a half, and it was only used till 2002. The injector opening pressure on that, on that style of injection pump was set to like 310, 314 bar of opening pressure. And the bar is like 14.5039 PSI. So if you want to do the math, there's that. But it's like, call it 305 on the average bar of opening pressure. Today, we haven't set an injector pop pressure more than 290 in 15 years. VP44 failures drastically drop as soon as you ask the pumping plunger to quit pushing against something so tight. So 
back in the old day, the VP44 failed a lot, but it was also fed by the little tiny, you know, like Carter lift pumps that died a lot. Mm -hmm. You throw a fast pump on that thing today, and the fast pump lasts 200,000 miles, throw a set of injectors in at 290 uh, bar of opening pressure. I guarantee you that I could get 250,000 miles out of VP44 today. So, as I said, technology, we start to find all these little tiny remedies that start to work together, they become recipes, and bam. I would easily buy a 98.5 to 02 truck today as a daily, and I would fully expect to get 250K out of it. You know what? It's never going to have six transmission gears to choose from. Right. It, it's right. never going to have heated and air-conditioned seats. It's not going to have adaptive cruise control. It's still going to be, by design, kind of a relic, like a classic. You get in a 68 Camaro and, you know, hey, hon, Let's go for a drive. It's not jumping in a, a 2020 Camaro. Like, she's not going to be, like, super comfortable all day. The carburetor may vapor lock. Uh, you know, like, it's it's just not the same car, and that VP44 is never going to be as nice. But a VP44 truck, again, gets 20 miles per gallon, but, man, they were light. So, and then what was your LB7? Yeah, again, Bosch. They come out with the injectors. The 01 truck was the very first common rail on the road period, right? Yeah. So LB7s, they came out with uh, injectors that cracked. And then Bosch came out with a 200,000-mile warranty and said, we'll warranty these things forever, basically, because we want to make sure that we take care of a problem. We over-hardened the body. Okay, so, you know, fast forward five years, and injector warranties drop, you know, immensely. And then the truck still never came with a lift pump on it. So they like to eat air. And I shouldn't say they like to but they ingest a lot of air because the CP3 pump has to draw fuel from the tank through the fuel filter to itself, and inadvertently it creates some air while that all happens. Air is really hard on the nozzles. So if I took a set of our LB7-50s or LB7 Ecos, threw them in the truck, put a fast pump on the truck, and drove it, guarantee you 250,000 miles out of that set of injectors, as long as I service fuel filters and things like that, like it's going to be good to go. Again, it's, it's not rocket science. It's just small recipes that keep getting better and better and better. Pretty soon it becomes something very stable. So for the people that are complaining about stuff that we have to deal with today, EGR, you know, things like that, hey, look, we're, we're cooking on it. We, we've been working on it, and uh, I think that you're driving a much better truck today than you would have been 10 years ago, even though you missed the old one. But just pay attention, and uh, the little things are changing, and the little things are making your, your driving experience much, much better. And as far as, you know, like with the Premier Land Cruise, it's like that it, it's an example of just a ton of diesel companies, a ton of successful owners and, and people that are all there in one group for a series of days. And, you know, the average truck person isn't going to be there. They're not going to know, you know, be able to, to talk with you or Braden Fleece or any of these other guys that are there. What kind of sentiment or what kind of vision you know when you left did you have for for diesel for the the aftermarket the the recipes like you talked about for making these trucks you know last and what people want well i I don't think that i can answer that very well because when you're at the cruise first off i will say this the people that are there, it's like Premier's top 100 dealers, whether it's e-commerce or drive-in, like brick-and-mortar type shops. It's their top 100 people that have earned so many points over this year. You're there with people that are very competitive by nature. So even though it's just your average shop owner per se, or he might think he's his average shop owner, he, he may view himself as average. I view 100 of those people that were there and their spouses or what have you, I view all of them as like the people that compete yearly to get on the cruise and they've done a good enough job that they made it eat some of them oh kenny's there i think he's there every year um really quiet you know guy that just kind of acts chill and he's not really in your face all the time but obviously that guy's not lacking competition in his heart because he wouldn't be on the cruise every year you know what i'm saying right having that many vendors on site with that many people that you know buy our product sell our product and believe in our product that's a super flattering situation altogether, and it's amazing for any company, whether it's Premier, Turn 14, any of those companies that are assembling that kind of a deal, for any of them to put us all together like that is a great way to make their own business stronger and grow. Um, 
you know, the people that I didn't know on this cruise this year, that was great to get to know them. I collected a pile of phone numbers. It gave Jolinas and I some insight on what we need to do to make our company a bit stronger. So we've got some plans cooking on that, and we've got uh, – we're going to make some different changes to, to increase sales. Did I learn anything about, like, what I need to do to my product? No. Um, I learn that daily in my shop. Like, when the customers call up with problems, I, I try and replicate problem. I try and fix problem. What I did the most, probably the most powerful, like, experience that I had last week, uh, I'm sitting in this little club, like this, uh, you know, it's basically pastries and, small sandwiches and cocktails and, you know, they give you a bottle of water, but water is, like, very sparse there. Alcohol is, like, hand, you know, readily handed out, but water not so much. The One of my old buddies, like, one of the very first guys I ever met in this industry, uh, Peter Pfeiffer from South Bend Clutch, he's not even on the cruise. The dude showed up because he knew we were all going to be there. He shows up, walks in with his wife, Karen, and... I turn around and I was like, holy shit, you've got to be kidding me. Like, he's got employees that are here already that don't even know he's coming. He just showed up to hang out because it's been a lifestyle. He created a lifestyle. He was part of the creation of a lifestyle. Um, you know, you might want to call him like the Hoist Gracie of like, uh, you know, MMA only. You know, the guy's been around since day one. He's, he's, and he helped me a lot. Like, he definitely... As soon as I saw that son of face, I turned around and I was like, holy shit, he took, he took Wednesdays off. Oh, man. I told everybody in my crew, I was like, I'm going to start not coming to work on Wednesdays. Like Peter told me a long time ago, hey, man, I'm going to work my ass off Monday, Tuesday. I'm taking Wednesday to hang out with my wife and think about my company. And then Thursday, I'm going to walk in more, you know, Thursday morning and I'm going to sprint for two days. I'm going to take two days off. Back then, I thought he was crazy, you know, because I thought, man, you're just building up momentum by Wednesday. And here it is. We're, you and I are speaking on a Wednesday. Yeah. My intention is to get a haircut, do some, you know, things for Lenny. So when Lenny goes back to work Thursday, he's fresh and he's ready to kill it on Thursday, Friday. That's kind of my intention. So, you know, like the proof's in the pudding. You, you can't fight stats. They're, they're real. Uh, Peter took Wednesdays off and, you know, he's retired. All the rest of us are still working. So... That was the most insightful impact that I picked up out of last week. And, uh, well, that, because I'm fairly competitive, uh, Braden Fleece, he's like, he used to be really good at football. I don't know, maybe he still is, but he's also about, you know, half a foot taller than me at best, you know, at, at the minimum. <laughs> we're standing, like, you know, we're standing outside at the pool at this little, like, tiki hut-looking little bar, right? And, uh... So there's a bunch of us there, like Jelinas and Braden and um, the Hamilton brothers, uh, just a bunch of us kind of standing around. And Braden starts telling us football stories, and I was like, okay, stop. Like, no, you're, you're not that fast. I will, I will at five foot nine, 275 pounds, I'm about to embarrass you and smoke your ass on that beach right now. In my mind... It was it was gonna be this romantic scene of like Rocky Balboa and Apollo <laughs> like sprinting down the beach. <laughs> you know? <laughs> it was literally gonna be like we're gonna be on the beach and we're gonna sprint and one of us is gonna win and it's gonna be me. Like my, my mind is already like I've painted the picture, it's dialed in. Like <laughs> So we go <laughs> we scratch a line in the sand <laughs> and uh one of his guys goes three, two, one and uh, Braden basically, he says Lenny was spooled up to 70 pounds of boost and broke an input shaft. But what happened, uh, <laughs> like, I'm telling you, man, in my mind, I've already won. Like, you might as well hand me a trophy. Like, it's cool. Like, I've got this. Uh, so we're standing on this little line, three, two, one. I take off on everything I got. I make it probably four steps. Bear in mind, 275, haven't stretched all day, and I haven't drank water in probably two days. I tear a calf. Ooh. Oh, God. Like, I'm still in pain. Like, I'll probably be down and out for, you know, a month. But the competitive nature that we all have, everybody in, you know, this industry that I'm aware of, really, would basically take the race no matter what. You know, it wasn't just me. It was like a lot of guys would basically say, oh, no, no, no. You may, be, you may have been fast, but I own you today. And, uh, well, I mean, I may have come out ahead, but I'll guarantee you I'm not going to be racing many time in the near future. Like, he won. There's that. 
So, yeah, good times. Good times. The the thing that, that's so interesting to me is, I'd say where, where this industry is at as far as time-wise is uh, nearly everyone I've talked to on the podcast or have known started as a truck guy. And way before they ever thought of a sign, a website, a phone number, making a part, um, working on trucks, they were an enthusiast. And I think that's why, as a diesel truck owner, we are competitive. We want the torque numbers. Ford, GM, and Ram know that, and we see that with the torque wars and the power wars that they're having. They know that we're competitive. And that was – it's something that, that's very exciting as a, as a storyline in everything is I don't see you guys slowing down. I don't see a lot of other companies. They're not slowing down. They're they're expanding and they're embracing this technology and embracing the things that they can do and what we can get out of these new trucks. And I know, you know, sp- specifically with injectors and what we had talked about last time is what you're able to do with them on brand new trucks and the efficiency you're able to get out of them. Like, that's cool. That's what we want. We want these things to last. We want them to idle smooth. We want them to, you know, make good power and allow us to, you know, either put a ton of miles on them or tow with them or use them for work. However, we're using these trucks. And that's what I'm so excited about as it relates to diesel performance and diesel companies, the industry and the trucks that are out there and the people buying them. I I feel like diesel is still the king even though EGR is still on the truck. There's ways around that, period. Ways around it, number one, make sure that you choose the proper gearing for the tire size and the duty cycle which you plan on putting the truck in. So if you bought a truck with uh, 3.73s and you throw a set of 37s on it and driving it down the highway, it's loafing along at 15 or 1600 RPM, call your gear people. You know, call Nitro, call whoever you want. Get your gear people on the line and say, hey, look, I've got this truck. My final drive ratio is this. I drive down the road to 30, you know, 36.4 inch tall tires. Like physically measure them. Don't read the sidewall and then, you know, assume it. Physically measure the tire. Call up your gearing guy. Get some expert advice on what it's going to take to get that thing to drive down the road at, say, 65, 70 miles an hour, right at about 2,000 RPM. The EGR system will function better. It'll have more volume and more velocity pumping through it. The oil will not get so damaged so early because of that. Uh, Round two. The second thing is just because your dashboard tells you you've got 10 or 20% of, like, oil life left, don't believe it. Your, Your truck doesn't really know what you've done to it on this oil change. If you were fortunate enough to drive the thing on the freeway a lot and you got it good and warm and you heat soaked it well, it may be dead correct, and your oil might look great. But if you're the guy that kills me, which is it's cold, and I have remote start, which I didn't have back in 2006, and I push remote start, and I sit there and I chat with the wife and the kids while I drink my cup of coffee. You walk outside, and your truck's nice and warm. Well, it wasn't back in 06. It wasn't back in 99. So all those trucks that we miss these days, you know, like the romance of like, oh, I wish I would have never got rid of that truck. They forget about all this stuff they didn't have as options. It dies because it only runs for 10 minutes on remote start. And they're like, well, it's actually pretty chilly, and my coffee cup's not quite empty. So they push remote start again, and like commanded, the truck fires right up, and it does its thing. You walk outside. It hasn't made any load or exhaust gas temperature in 20 minutes of operation at 14, 10, minus 10 degrees, and the oil just took a hit. So if you're that guy, you're not going to go four, five, 6,000 miles on an oil change. You probably are going to be the 3,000-mile er, uh, candidate. So, you know, between just doing a few things, making your own tweaks to your own truck um, and changing the way you use the truck, like it'll make EGR, DPS, all those systems will last better. When you go to the shop for repair, they might not tell you all of these things. They might not have thought about all of the stuff that I'm thinking about because my trucks are in great shape. Like, they've all got EGR, DPF, all still intact, but I use the dipstick. Like, I don't just expect my my dashboard to tell me when it's time to change oil. And if I'm going to use remote start, which I do, um, I'm going to plan on changing the oil more frequently rather than less. Um, You know, if I drive to UCC and then out to Ohio and then New Jersey and then back home, I might I might get ten or 12,000 miles out of those, you know, five gallons of oil. But if I'm going to use remote start here at the house, 
and then putt stored, which is a couple miles, I'm probably going to get 3,000 miles out of that oil. And, man, there's, there's some really good additives. If you've got a truck that's got a bunch of um, carbon left in the oil and it's all black and nasty all the time, there's some really good additives. We sell some stuff called PowerMax. You pour it in the crankcase, and basically it suspends the leftover carbon, and then when you pull the drain plug, it flushes a lot of it out. If it's a Huey system, it flushes out like 100% of it. But if it's a non-Huey system, oil pressure never sees, you know, that kind of – Huey pressure is a minimum seven, 800 pounds, even at idle, and then a maximum of over 2,000. So it really does a good job of scrubbing those systems. But if it's Cummins, no Huey system, things like that, um, the hotter you can get the oil, so if you can go out and really work it with the uh, with the oil system cleaner in it, then when you pull the drain plug, you'll have a lot better success cleaning up that EGR damaged oil. I think a lot of this too is just as a like a truck owner is we've you know things like podcasts, YouTube videos, websites, blogs, articles, things like that. As we become more educated with these things, verse when the you know the changes happened in in, in two thousand seven and the the OEM equipment has gotten better, but I think and we talked a little bit of, uh, about it before the podcast is diesel truck owners want them to last. And that's really the heart of why we buy them and, and why we gravitate towards that and the torque and all these other creature benefits are, you know, like remote start and heated and cooled seats and the, the screens and the dash and everything like that. That's just icing on the cake. But I feel like that's where things are, are turning now with any of the, the, the big three is they're more reliable than they were in 2007 and 2008. And it, it makes me excited to think, you know, where they're at now, but then where they're going to be at in a couple of years or five years, how they're evolving and then how the aftermarket, you know, jumps in and, and solves some of the, the issues that an OEM is just not going to address. And so I think it's a really exciting time, and especially with the technology, the power, the tow ratings, the payload capacity, they're just they're great trucks. All of the newer trucks, Ford, Chevy, Dodge, the, uh, the little Titan from Nissan, I think all of those trucks are outstanding. And yes, I agree. Like 10 years ago, you know, if you was to, if you was to find a barn find that had 500 miles on it, uh, some poor guy passed away and some poor widow just opened up the barn one day and goes, oh, well. My husband bought that thing brand new, and it was a 06 Ford Chevy Dodge. Don't care. Compare it drivability-wise, brake-wise, and transmission-wise with the exact same truck today, and you would be, you'd be humbled. It, it, it's not the same quality of truck. All the creature comforts, uh, the brakes, the steering, all that stuff, the, the sway bars, the frames, all the geometry, like all these newer trucks, you jump in them and tow. And, I mean, I know guys that have trucks that are three years old, and they're like, dude, I just drove a 2024. What do you think about that? That thing is a beast. Yeah, they're a fantastic truck. They're way better than they were three, four, five years ago. So I vote, you know, get something new. And if you're going to tow, there's going to be a lot of guys that are kind of naysayers. You know, like we're talking about, you know, the people that are jumping from um, from diesel back to gas or worse yet, like, uh, you know, the electric stuff. Um it's it's mind blowing to me, you know. You're talking about hey, look, diesel owners want their trucks to last two, three, four hundred thousand miles, but yet there's so many uh, people that are chanting how electric cars and trucks, you know, Musk is there. Elon's coming out with that Tesla pickup truck, full charge, two hundred fifty miles, and uh, that's empty. That's an empty vehicle weight. The truck only weighs fifty one hundred and thirty pounds, but yet. They allow it to tow up to 14, or GVW at 14,000 pounds, so they're willing to put 9,000 pounds on the back of that truck. All right, for anybody that's ever played with a, uh, an RC race car or even any sort of uh, electric-powered fan, if you turn it on and you go slow with it, you get 250 miles out of it. But if you throw your boat behind it that weighs 9,000 pounds because that's what they say it can tow, you think it's going to go 250 miles? No. But then the charging time on that truck is 9.5 hours. So I can drive up to any pump anywhere, even a slow pump. I can put 50 gallons of fuel in my truck in less than 10 minutes, and I can drive away. Or if I buy this new Tesla truck, nine and a half hours. So I basically walk inside, I park my truck in the garage, 
and then I plug the charger into it, which is a 240 volt charger at 40 amps. That's a lot of juice. Yeah. Like that is, I mean, can you imagine like operating a welder day in and day out at 40 amps and then paying the electric bill on that? Nine and a half hours. So it's not going to be cheap. I mean, first, they're not even cheap trucks. They're, their base model, which only tows 10,000 pounds, or max GVW at 10,000, so about 5,000 behind the truck, that's $50,000, 49 grand. And their their more heavy duty truck is 70 grand, 69.9, and you get 14,000 pounds towing capacity. Well, I mean, basically we're talking about a uh, it's like a Hemi with the 6.4 or the Ford with their big motor. Like that's what you're really towing against is about that. Um. It just, these people, these hybrid people, it's not going to work out. Like, I just don't see it. I mean, a lot of people were going to lose a few to gas, but as far as somebody that wants to tow, I don't see hybrids being the way to go quite yet. It's just not there. And quite honestly, Patrick, in your and my life, I don't think that the, I don't think that the Eastern people are going to allow any sort of real penetration with the electric market, whether it be a Toyota Prius or what have you, because they've got trillions of barrels of oil in reserve. So, you know, that being said, with what we've got going today, um, with oil being that readily available, and basically they've been holding on to it. They've been holding it back so they can keep the price of it fairly high, right? Like they've got to have a profit. That, and the fuel companies have been making more profit than anybody else on the planet for decades. That's just the way it's played. Um, OPEC is supposed to keep everybody kind of in line, and you're only supposed to provide – you're only supposed to uh, produce so much oil based off what OPEC says. But unfortunately, like the United States, United Kingdom, Canada, are really the only people on the planet that are living by what OPEC has for rules. And, you know, the Saudis, people in the East, they're just doing whatever they want because who's going to stop them at this point? There's so much money there. There's no way you can really roll them over. So, you know, I'm, I'm kind of... It makes me think about, like, cause when I was a kid, I never went to see it. I never got to see it. But there was a shortage of gasoline during, like, the 70s and what have you, right? Yeah. Um, and in 1980, those shortages were over. And we had, by 1980, we were bringing in, we were providing ourselves with about 8.5 million barrels of oil per day. Now, politics kick in, and then we need to conserve the earth, even though we're not. Um, and we start to use less. So by 1990, we're down to like 7.7 .7 million barrels per day. And then by 2000, we're at 6.0 million barrels. 2010, politics really kick in, and we're saving the planet, right? No, we're not. We're still driving, but we're importing more oil because we're now down to 5.5 million barrels of oil being produced by the U.S. per day. 2017 was the, the latest data I could find. And in 2017, we're up to 10 million barrels of oil being produced by Americans, being consumed by Americans every single day. So the politics behind all of this stuff, basically they don't vote towards hybrids ever being like a really strong staple. I mean, handwriting's on a wall. Like, we've got, we've got our own, plus we're not consuming the stuff in the Middle East right now, not near as much anyway. Canada's struggling financially. They're, I mean, they've got a pile of oil up there, but now that we're providing our own to our own selves, we don't need to import as much from Canada. So, you know, everybody I know in Canada is like, man, our economy is not that great. Well, a lot ties into every single thing that we do. And, you know, back to the electric car. How much of the electric car charges off of coal-fired plants? It's a big chunk. It's like 50%. So awesome. even though you're, you're plugging in your, your green car, you're not really that green. You're using coal to charge that car. You just don't see the coal plant, so it makes you feel warm and fuzzy. And then, you know, let's, what's a cell phone battery? Two, three years tops. Um, you know, a Duracell battery is two, three years. A camera battery is two, three years. I did a little research on the Tesla. Um, Batteries, they're like, uh, by the time you get a Tesla battery installed in your car, it's over $10,000. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Now, the fantastic thing is trying to mine, like, oil and whatnot, we've got that pretty well under wrap. Like, we've got ways to, to produce it without damaging the environment. 
but the lithium the lithium ion that's coming out of the ground like those those mines are pretty wicked and then how do you dispose of this stuff like that's the real question i've heard some people i've watched some things saying that we're basically taking large ships and we're driving out to the middle of the ocean and we're offloading lithium iron batteries into the ocean i i don't know it just doesn't sound like a great plan for health to me like i don't think that the electric car is really the way to go yet it's really interesting that you mentioned that because I have been seeing that come up more in the automotive world is like, I don't know quite how to phrase this, but it almost seems like things got a little tougher or they changed. I should say things changed from what we were used to for 10 years. Right. And it's like, I've got to jump to this other thing, or I've got to look at this other, this other platform. And you laid it out really clear. There is, I can't think of any real diesel truck enthusiasts that I know that are going to be cool with having to plug their truck in for nine hours to go 250 miles, un, you know, unloaded. And most of these guys are towing something, whether it's a work trailer, a fifth wheel, a whole bunch of stuff behind them. That's most the reason why they got them and how viable that is in the short term. I, I, I don't see it either. I don't see this massive wave of interest in, guys taking their 2019s and 2017s and trading them in to get this. And you know, relating it back to diesel is that's what I see in the marketplace is how, how much technology and how refined the, the products and the R and D and the engineering, like the machines you talked about that you invested in, those sorts of things are there for a 2003 and they're going to, they're, they're there for a 2020, you know, or even an older truck. And it's like, from a financial standpoint and a viability standpoint and me as a truck owner, you know, wh what do I feel comfortable with? I, I mean, I couldn't make that jump either. I, I couldn't, I couldn't spend my hard earned money on, you know, something that I got to charge for nine hours a day. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, I mean, let's just picture like, you know, young guy, wife, kids, uh, lives in California. He's trying to be environmentally safe. He makes really good money. He lives in a pretty nice house. I mean, he's got a, a wakeboard or a surfboat, right? Yeah. Um, the, uh, the the young guy goes ahead and he hooks onto his, uh, his new electric truck, and he wants to drive to the lake up in the mountains. Well, now he's got his wife, he's got his kids, and halfway up the mountain, like, uh-oh, we've got to find a charging center. So fortunately, he's in California, and there's a lot of charging centers. So now he pulls over and he says, well, kids, let's get a hotel. What do you mean? Well, we're going to be on the charger for nine hours. So we're done. Like, we've only traveled four hours, but we're done today. We're going to travel the other two hours tomorrow, and we'll be at the lake all weekend. And then on the way home, instead of it being a straight through drive home, it's now one day because you've got a charging center on the way home. It, it makes no sense to me at all. Yeah. And if you look at other states where they don't have charging centers everywhere, it's even it's even less of a distance you can travel or more of a logistical kind of nightmare you'd have to you'd have to plan for. And I think I think it's a great conversation, you know, to have is to talk about these other platforms, these other competing either ideas or, or platforms that are, you know, are vying for kind of the, the, the lifestyle or the, or the way that we use these trucks. And it's just, it's really interesting. And I love getting different perspectives on it, you know, as well. And it was, it was something, like I said, I'm really glad you brought up because I wanted to ask, and I, I forgot earlier is just what, what you thought of it, because it seems to be everywhere on social media and on the news. And I'm seeing updates and stuff all the time of, you know, the, the Tesla truck and, and, and other things, but it's, uh, you know, it, it, I, I just think it's such a cool time in diesel, you know, compared to where it was. Like I, my first truck was a 2008. I bought it brand new, had three miles on it when I test drove it. Um, somebody I know bought a 2020 3,500 Ram and sitting in the two trucks is an entirely different experience. The ride's an entirely different experience. The transmission feel, um, the way the exhaust brake works, the radio, the speakers, like it's just, it's totally different. And 
I appreciate that. I mean, I definitely appreciate the older ones. My dream trucks is always going to be a second gen 12th valve that I get to restore. But if I'm going to drive across country, I'd prefer to have a new one. Absolutely. And you know what's so these new trucks come out with a thousand watt stereo system. That's pretty dope. They they drive amazing. They've got amazing brakes. I mean, my my brand new Ram. I think it's good to what thirty seven thousand five hundred pounds GBW. That's, you know, it's not legal for somebody without a CDL to even tow that heavy or, or to drive a vehicle that heavy. But if you throw a camper on the back with a boat, the truck barely knows it's even there because, it, yeah. you know, they've already over-designed it for so many pounds of weight. And, yeah, it's super safe. You throw your wife and your kids in there, you got your horses in there, they, you, know, you come up over the top. Like you said, there's an exhaust brake and a bunch of gears. The exhaust brake doesn't – let's just – let's go back to your, your dream truck, like your holy grail. You've got your – is it going to be a, a 47 or 48 truck, or is it going to be a five-speed truck? I would. De- I, I like the autos. I know I might be in the minority, but, yeah, I'd, I'd go with the auto. All right, cool. So now you spend $10,000 on building yourself a really good 47 or 48, mm-hmm. and it's really good. It's got all three shafts in it. It's got a good converter in it. And then now what size tires are going to be on? Yeah, I've got to go through the tires, the wheels, the gearing. Um, I'm not going to be happy with 180 crank horsepower or 210 or whatever they were. So I'm going to have to do something on the power side. You're uh, literally, for you to keep up in that truck towing with your camper and, you know, your family, you're going to be 600 horsepower and the transmission is going to get the shit kicked out of it because going from second to third and third to fourth, there's a thousand RPM drop in between gears. Yeah. I'm going to jump in my brand new truck that only has like a three or 400 RPM drop between gears and it lives and the 400 horsepower, you will not outrun me. By the end of the day, that old truck, the old restored truck, like you build 650 horsepower with it, it's got twins on it, it's, it's just not the same. Like the brakes aren't the same, the steering's not the same. I don't think that we're in such a bad spot. Everybody else seems to find, well, I shouldn't say everybody, but a lot of other people seem to think that we're getting screwed right now, and I just don't see it myself. Like, I think the trucks are too goddamn good. I think that Ford, Ram, and General Motors know what truck owners want. I think they spend a lot of money to figure out exactly what we prefer in a truck, and that's why they deliver what they do within the framework that they're given. You know, obviously with emission standards, but I, you know, I remember when the third gens came out, you know, you somebody pick one up and they said, oh, the interior is so much nicer than my second gen. Like, this is light years better. And then the GM and the Ford guys are like, no, it sucks. And then the four gens come out and you're like, wow, the third gens were kind of cheap inside and things rattled yeah. and all this stuff. And yeah. now they're all, they're all really nice. And there's not that trade-off where like, oh, I'm buying this 06 Ram for the engine and I've got to sacrifice the interior for it. Or I'm buying this Duramax because it rides so nice and I love the things that are in it and that's why I didn't get the Ram. It, it, that, that's totally changed. Yeah, like I, I truthfully don't care what brand you buy right now. I think you're getting a really good truck. And every one of the trucks today uh, probably have a better transmission stock than you could build for five thousand dollars out of one of the older four speed trannies. Oh yeah. I, I just and like you said, there's an exhaust brake on it. Like there's guys the the big punches of doing stuff super easy. Like you delete the truck, you strip the truck, and you basically shove the truck straight to five hundred horsepower at the rear tire. Those days are over. Right now they're over until we figure something else new out, which is coming. Like but Progress is always very small steps. It's never like, hey, look, I just reinvented the wheel last night. Check this out. It's very small steps made every single day. Sometimes they're backwards. But, the, you know, the competition that you've referred to already, like if I'm not going to make success today but BD does make success or ATS does make success, the all-around general success of the community and the diesel industry has grown stronger. So when one of the other companies comes out with something that's better than mine or if they come out with something that complements mine, the entire industry gets to share that recipe and gets to use that recipe for a better product. And then pretty soon the OEMs go, hey, that was a really good idea. And then they start doing it. Yeah. I mean, that, <laughs> they do, right? Yeah. 
I mean, something so simple as like even a bed liner. Like you can buy a factory bed liner sprayed in at Ford Chevy Dodge right now, and it used to be a Line X thing. Like you would literally like pick up your truck, and the dealership would have taken it to Line X. They would have dropped it off. They would have had it sprayed. You picked it up with your liner, and you financed it in the truck. Today, they just you know it's an option. You click a box, it comes with the spray and bed liner, or even the floor mats. Like yes, the, the third gen I bought, it was just like carpet floor mats, and now. The 2020, like it had really nice floor mats. It's just a small example, but it's like that's already there. The bed liner's already there. The all these things are, are, are just there. And yeah, I think that that competition side, which is what we started the podcast with, is is absolutely it, it, that's you know a company comes out with something and that competitive nature, right? Of the owner or the group of people there, it's like we can do that. And I think we can do it better. They come out with something, or somebody pushes the envelope with a turbocharger or a fuel system or something like that. Well, this other company's like, hey, well, we could step up and we can, you know, lend our expertise this way. And I think that's how diesel got to the point it did where, you know, a thousand horsepower was a crazy number. And, you know, now it's 2000 or 3000 or a little over that. It's that competition. And I think the truck owner at the end of the day is really what that's, they're like that too, whether it's doing the best job they can or towing, um, you know, as much as they need to, or just having, you know, a, a comfortable ride, a reliable vehicle, we're competitive. That's why we're into automotive so much and motorsports and, and all these things. So it was really interesting to to get your perspectives and sit down and, and chat with you. And there's going to be a lot of uh, a lot of listeners are going to be happy when we release this episode because they're like, get Lenny back on. I want to, I want to hear him talk about more stuff. So <laughs> it was really cool. Yeah, no, it's it's always a pleasure to be back on. And I mean, I really, it was an overwhelming, very flattering feeling to have so many people reach out to me directly after that last podcast. And, you know, I really do, I think that what you're doing for this diesel industry altogether is, uh, that was a pretty powerful statement to me. Like, obviously, when people from New Zealand are reaching out saying, hey, nice work, um, you're on the air, you're live. Like, people are listening to us, you know, right now from that per, that podcast you and I just did. Uh, they're listening to it right now, and I'm just I'm so proud of what you've got going here. It's just uh, it's pretty flattering. Like it's I, I really appreciate the opportunity to be on again. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I know your time is valuable. You got a ton going on and, and doing different things. So taking an hour out of your day to chat with us and our listeners, I appreciate it. I look forward to to seeing you maybe at some events this year, and uh, catch it back up with you once you get those programs written for the machines that are cranking on it. Are you going to be at the ATS, uh, their uh, gauntlet challenge here in a couple weeks? Yeah, I always like to swing by for a little bit. It gets so packed with, like, parking and everything, but it's so cool to go and and see just the the people that are there, but then also, you know, like you and, and Clint and just other people that are in the industry and walk down, like, Vendor Row, and there's, like, there's Alligator and there's Industrial Injection and all these different companies. It's It's a really cool time to meet up with everyone. So the parking does get to be a bit restrictive, but I thought of a new idea, and here's what I'm going to do. <laughs> like, just a few miles away, there's a, a Twin Peaks restaurant. They sell steak, right? I have been there a time or two, yeah. I'm going to park there at, like, 8 or 9 in the morning, and then I'm going to go to the event. And I'm going to Uber from Twin Peaks to ATS, and then I'll have to fight with the parking. And then when I'm done at ATS, I will Uber to Twin Peaks, <laughs> and then I'll just jump in my car and drive it back to the hotel. There you go. Like dinner, like I always, I try to never miss a meal and, you know, like I, I just designed a way that I'm going to eat at the same time as like not have to worry about fighting with parking. Oh yeah. It's, I don't know about this year. I think last year I, I got there really early, like seven or maybe even a little bit before and I got a spot. But if, if you're not there, like around a certain time, you're parking two or three blocks away and depending on the weather, which you never know in March in Denver, what it's going to be like, it can uh, either be a really nice walk or you're walking in snow. <laughs> well i already told you my secret so try it <laughs> awesome i look forward to seeing you there and and uh, like i said chatting with you here and in, in a in a few weeks and catching up on those machines and some new things you got going on right on patrick i do appreciate it thank you very much don't forget diesel fans if there's any questions you have for lenny or the dynamite diesel products crew about injectors for your truck Make sure and reach out to them, give them a call, jump on their social media, send them a message. Or if you have suggestions for a future episode, 
or a topic that you'd like Lenny and I to, to talk about, just leave a comment. If you're listening to this on YouTube, we do read the comments all the time or on Instagram or Facebook. Just look up the Diesel Podcast. You can send us a direct message. You can comment on the post. We love to hear from you guys and topics that you want to hear about. Till next time, keep the shiny side up.